life. And in the next few years, wearable tech will allow us to blend seamlessly into a digital world unlike ever before. Tonight, we're going to journey into a future where music is not only listened to, but also more than your favorite clothing and accessories. We've got an all-star lineup of disruptors from all over the globe who will be discussing the convergence of wearable audio technologies. And tonight, we've got Vin Rock from Naughty by Nature in the house. Looping a drum kit. I'm activating the accelerometer to modify the pitch and speech.
new DAO, which uh, we refer to as being the nexus between Silicon and style, and we regard the body as a node in the network system, and we define the skin as a metaphor to conceive computational fashion. So what that basically means is that everything the skin does, we want our garments to do. Whether that is changing color, we are tanning, uh, that is changing the shape, uh, we are our hair so it might stand up, we are transpiring uh, water, so actually we are actuating. So there are lots of different things our actual um, organ um, does, the skin actually does, and we want to manipulate that. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little bit of uh, what that is going to be. technology and the body. I mean, how crazy is that? But at the same time, it's, it's inspiring, it's visionary, it's crazy, it's cool. I'm Sabine Seymour, I'm pushing the boundaries between fashion science and technology, and Intel is helping us to push these boundaries with their technologies. So I'm the founder of Moondial. We want to extend Oracles to fashion, and we really consider a garment to be a member of the larger system, which is networked. We basically invent portable technology, focusing mostly on the body. It's really all about making things to be integrated in a textile or into a garment. Intel produces the runs of our garments. Then also, they're basically having their chips in pretty much every product. We might use what we search for programming. So there are tools and components to have in Our textile will be our display. I'm going for the actual manipulation of the molecule on that nanoscale level that enables you to actually then make a change in the textile itself. Imagine I have like these two or three favorite aspects of mine. They really fit me, they're economic, I mean they're just perfect. But the patterns, you know, would be fantastic just to have this one with me and then every couple of days I'm changing the pattern. I'm thinking of that. It's becoming more interesting and it's going to be uh, moving really quickly over the next decade. So, but I want to focus on sound today. I really want to focus on different types of projects uh, in this space. Um, so, uh, sound on the body has been uh, in something new. Um, so, in 1922, actually, this is an image from Susan Lee's book um, where she features the reindeer hat. Um, we got the news of the jacket from Maggie Orth and her fellows up at MIT from 1997, which was a student project with electronics that you can actually manipulate the sound. Um, and then uh, what I want to show you is a video uh, by Nico that was featured last year at um, South By. The Miko system is made up of two parts, the Miko headphone and the Miko iPhone. The Miko headphone detects brain waves through the sensor on your forehead. The Miko app then automatically analyzes the user's condition of the brain and searches for music that best matches from the Miko database and plays the selection that fits the user's mood. That's exactly what the app I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool.
are amazing. We have our favorite techno progressivist, Matthew Waltman. Thank you, Matthew. That's better. Actually, um, I am the founder and chief creative officer of Nuka. We are best known for our timepieces. I have to actually like cue myself with like, how my slides made. And also other accessories that champion uh, universal visual language and universal form language. We're going to segue and relaunch our brand next year in wearable computing and wearable tech and with a focus on audio products. So I'm venturing into a little bit of a new area for my type of presentation because I usually give a presentation about monoculture and universal language. But I want to talk about how technology has always changed the music industry. Because I feel that if everyone, right now what everyone's doing is they're, they're chasing uh, other people's successes. You know, you look at what happens with cell phones and people are just, and I hate to say it, but they're copying the iPhone. You're not, you don't see a lot of innovation. And I really believe that there's only real innovation in design not when you focus on design itself, but you focus on the actual human behaviors and uh, on the linguistics on how people actually communicate with the devices on a conceptual level. So, let's talk about music. Because everyone here remembers how the music industry was rumbling and suing everyone uh, with the MP3 downloads and uploads a couple of years ago, late 90s, early, early noughts. And it's not just digital technology and new technology that disrupts music, but it's and, and music in the industry. Technology has always shaped the music industry. Now, of course, I'm not old enough, and no one here is old enough to remember. But in the 19th century, before the advent of affordable printing, music was actually rele relegated to you either did folk music at home or you did very, very high-end type opera-type music, or if you were a wealthy family, to hire a quartet to come to play in your home. But when you had uh, inexpensive printing, it actually created the birth of the pop song, because you were able to put all this information, all this content, on something that could be reproduced, and people could play the songs at home. So then you move uh, more into the, uh, the last century, the 20th century, and the phonograph, is actually, the phonograph record is responsible for changing music from the pop song to actually the pop group or to the performer. Because what used to be just the content of the music being reproduced by individual musicians, now we were able to reproduce the actual performances. And this was an actual very, very important change that might not look like a technological change, but it is, because it changed the way the music was produced and got us to the television and radio era where you had the studio system. The same studio system that was with film now got applied to music, where large companies would spend money to produce the musical acts, and then they would promote the musical acts, and they would also control the reproduction of the music via the photograph. And it was actually really, again, a really huge change that was shaped by the technology and shaped the way that people experienced, perceived, and consumed music. So then you have in the 90s, the MP3. And what happened with the MP3 is it became, music became fragmented. Uh, people started downloading and uploading, and you didn't really need to listen to the radio anymore to find out about music. Now, there's a lot of press and people talking about how this affected the music as an industry. And you can also point to Apple and iTunes and how that became a new industry or a new type of distribution system. But the real important thing is how it fragmented how people experience music. Where it used to be in the 60s and 70s, you might have been a whole fogey that hated the Beatles, but you knew who they were, and you knew what the music sounded like. Now I can tell you honestly, from my own personal experience, I know who Justin Bieber is. I really do. I know what he looks like. He has his shirt off all the time. He's an adorable 19 or 20 year old blonde boy. I could not identify any of his music. I do not listen to his music. So there are lots of bands and acts now that are they're popular, but it's not universal in terms of people actually identifying with who these people are. So this is like a major, 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 major change in how 
music is discovered and how music is enjoyed. So, we are all in our own personalized spaces. So, I was going to talk about, you know, I'm working on some new IP for audio products, about cloud-based audio products, but I actually am the anti-designer designer. I believe that eventually, no matter how proprietary a technology becomes, it eventually becomes ubiquitous. And when it becomes ubiquitous, it's really not about the technology itself, it's about the system and how things are delivered. So, to me, to give you a little prediction of what is the big change in music and what's going to be the big driver, it's not going to be the technology or the design of the products itself, it's going to be how is music discovered. If people are not discovering bands by going out to concerts or listening to the radio, how is this going to be accomplished? And this is, to me, the biggest opportunity. And this is what's going to be um, driven by ubiquitous sensor technology. It's going to be the person that owns or creates the best algorithm that can take all this data from sensor points and decide or figure out what it is that makes you happy, that this is music that you're going to enjoy. Um, and it's not going to be about self-reporting. It's going to be about collecting all your biometrics when you get audio or visual stimuli and then coming back and saying, you know, this is a good band for you, this is a good soundtrack for you, and then again with your software or your iPhone where you say, listen, I want, I want something that's going to inspire me to clean my apartment, do my laundry, and eventually this all-seeing, this algorithm that's going to become sort of like, you know, the terminator of algorithms is going to say, yeah, this is what you need to listen to. And people are not going to actively discover music. People are just going to be able to be fed this constant stream of wonderful, wonderful music. And to me, that's really, really, really where uh, the growth is going to be. You only have to look at the, everyone's always talking about why Apple paid so much money for Beats. And it's really, they, they have really good software for streaming. So right now the focus is on streaming. I believe the future is going to be on actually finding music through music discovery through these algorithms. And that's, whoever owns that space is going to be the next uh, big power player in the, uh, in the industry. So what other technologies are going to be used? Again, I, I, I like to say I'm like anti-aesthetics, anti-designer, designer. Uh, it's all about process and about linguistics. So there's, there's a, you know, photogenics, there's, there's going to be piezo. I always say this wrong. This is always embarrassing. Piezoelectric fibers are not only going to power devices; they might actually create the audio for the devices. And of course, implants. And I think the real future of how the products are going to be designed and manufactured is being genetic engineering and biotech. I think the uh, the ergonomics of headphones, whether they're in ear or over ear, just sucks. I mean, if, if you can design them as much as you want, they're never comfortable for everybody. The position of people's ears are not symmetric, the size of your ear canal is not consistent throughout the day, depending on your blood pressure and the air pressure and all this type of stuff. So, to, to me, it's the, it's the bioengineer, it's the genetic engineer that's going to really have breakthroughs in what's going to be the next wearable, wearable device. So, what's the future of design for wearables? It's, like I said, it's going to be it's going to be this bioengineering. I think it's really exciting. I can't wait till we all start hacking our bodies. And uh, I'm just going to end it with my quote that the future should not look like the past. So I, I really like everyone to challenge it. But as soon as you get nostalgic about things, you should really stop yourself. You know, just really try to. We're all moving to the future. We should all look the part. And I was told it's a Q&A. That's why I kept my presentation short. So I would like to take questions from the audience. But why wouldn't that be discoverable by an algorithm? Well, maybe not now and not for you, but at some point, sensor technology is going to be so ubiquitous that it is going to collect that information.
for people. And there's going to be the, an algorithm that's going to be able to extrapolate like where you were born and where you were raised. And maybe be able to figure out what songs you were exposed to as a child. And eventually, based on your feedback of whether you, you know, if you're, if you're responding to it in a positive way, the algorithm's going to learn, yes, I was right, or the algorithm's going to learn that I was wrong. So I don't see why that, that would be uh, an issue. You know, there, it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to project like, more into the future. I didn't want to talk about, like, you know, virtual SIM cards, and, you know, and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I wanted to try to open up the discussion to this type of thing. But it's a great question. But I think, I think uh, you know, I, I'm all for a positive uh, futurism. I think the sci-fi, like iRobot, I, I can't believe they made it into some kind of negative story. I think it was really positive to have this uh, computer that can look out for the well-being of, of all of humanity. I mean, I think it's a, you can have an algorithm that figures out what music you're going to enjoy. You know, why not? Okay, cool. And I encourage everyone to come up. So I have a, a slightly longer question. Can we turn this other one on? Check. No, no, but I wanted to have a bit of a dialogue. So you were talking just a minute ago about uh, um, you know, your, your biometrics determining what is the music for you. So, so here's some biometrics. You can tell me if you agree with them or disagree with them in your toys. Heart rate is one. Respiration is another. Temperature. Uh, we get blood pressure. Things like that. Okay, so, so how do we map those to, to different types of music? A person has to, has to create that mapping. And, and how would we do that to make it work? Well, it has to be... Uh... It'll work. They'll work. Oh, okay. this, this one makes me sound better. It's like much more it's deeper. Um, well, I think eventually the sensor technology is going to be more than just those type of metrics. You're going to get hormonal balances in the body. And you're also, when it becomes so ubiquitous, it's going to be able to connect when you're listening to music in a store, for example or at a friend's party. So throughout your life, it's going to be able to pull everything together to, be, to have a very, very rich database on, on reactions and what you've listened to. Like right now, what's happening when, uh, I mean, I find this even personally, I don't know if it happens to you, but I download so much music, I listen to it, I don't know what I'm listening to. I mean, people are not identifying songs with the artist anymore. They're like, oh, I really like that song. And, but it's like, oh, People say, well, who is it? And they take out their iPhone and they try to put it by the speaker and try to figure out who it is. So we are moving to this world where people are not connected to, of course, there's a certain period in your life in your early 20s when you're a teenager when you are obsessed about bands. But then you get to a point where you just want to listen to music to create a certain psychological or physical response. And I feel that that's the next generation. I think you and I are in this interstitial generation. We have this world where people don't really care about bands unless they are so, or now acts, unless they're so huge, they have so much celebrity that it becomes like this black hole or this giant planetary mass that, that demands your attention, then what happens to smaller bands or smaller bands? I really am not sure what's going to happen post-celebrity. Eventually there will be, I, I don't think there'll ever be a post-celebrity era because it's just human nature we love. It's very top down. It's very. It's not really a horizontal thing. So uh, I'm also. I mean, I think it's a great question. I can't answer it, but I'm really curious to see, like, how extreme celebrity culture has to be in order to command people's attention to the level that you need to know who these people are. Um, maybe it will be that you know we don't even need people. Maybe at some point music is just going to be totally. Generally, you know, on the fly by the, the you know our computer overlords that uh, tell us what to eat and what to exercise. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that question at all, didn't I? Hmm. Yes. I love Q and A's. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, so. Uh, I'd love to if you could like, at least 
massive out of that you're going to be having. Um, I'm going to bring up the recent issue that Facebook is getting a lot of flack with, um, with influencing the, uh, the news feed of some of their users um, to influence their emotions, and now they're getting a lot of flack about that. Um, with this kind of, I don't know, you're talking about there's the potential for this to be used wrong to where you can manipulate the listeners' emotions in a particular way to have them go out and buy whatever or do whatever or feel whatever. How do you as a designer um, kind of manipulate that into being like the purest form and not let it get used by it? Well, that's like five questions. But um, in terms of manipulation, the, for people to think that they're not being manipulated every waking minute of their day is, is a bit of a fantasy. And uh, it's, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, I don't even want to open up that can of worms with like privacy and Facebook. But the thing about the Facebook thing that's interesting though is how the media spun it. Like you know, they spun it as, as this evil story. If it was just reported in some kind of technology blog about an experiment about users' behaviors and users' emotional states, it, it wouldn't have gotten the same type of uh, animosity from a, So you have to see that that's, that's an emotional manipulation from the media as well. And they're motivated to get people to click on their pages and look at the ads, and it's the way everything is monetized, and it's crazy. But talking about emotional states and the designer's role, uh, and also in terms of Nuka, uh, that's a perfect question. I actually wasn't going to talk about Nuka, but because you asked that question, I am. Uh, the big problem in wearable tech right now is you have companies that all suffer from feature rights. You have Google that or Amazon launching products talking about we have this feature, we have that feature, and uh, we have this feature and this phone doesn't have that feature. And that is so antithetical to creating a successful brand. Because successful brands are fashion brands, and Apple is actually a fashion brand. Because Apple is more focused on creating an emotional connection between the end user and the company that the product itself is really just a, it's just a tool for connecting the person to the company. So in terms of what I'm doing with Nuka, um, I, all I do is create emotional connections. I mean, I actually create this illusion of technical progressivism when our products are actually very, very, very basic. You know, I have a patent for the closure of our belt, but it shows you that you can have a technological innovation that is purely mechanical and it still gives you the feeling of being part of, of a future movement, and it creates this emotional connection between the consumer and the product and the consumer and the brand. So my obsession has always been about on emotion. I design for emotional effect. I feel that emotion is a part of the feature set. And if you're not incorporating emotion as part of your feature set, you're not gonna be a brand that's gonna stick around. You know, as soon as, um, I'm not even gonna like, point fingers at brands that are doing sucky wearables right now, but I think practically all of them suck. And uh, when we enter the market, we're just gonna blow them out of the water. But uh, the things that we're working on right now are um, cloud-based audio products, because no one's really delivered on that. And um, I hate the fact that people say wearable computing, yet you have to tether it to your phone. So the device itself is not, doesn't have any computational power. It's not really doing any computing. So how is it a wearable computer? So um, our focus is going to be on audio products and wearables that are standalone. So if that means that it only does one thing, then that's what I want it to do that one thing very, very well. I don't want it to have to be connected to your cell phone. So I know that's very, very vague. And right now our Indiegogo is kind of like contradicts everything I stand for in my brand. It's a, it's a chronograph. It's a quartz chronograph. But I think that it does show that you can, uh, you know, that you can actually get the, the techno savvy crowd by having good design that connects emotionally. So, all right. So next up, we have an excellent company, CEO of a company who creates audio home control. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Anna Perlman of Stelly Audio. Um, I want to share with you a little bit. About Thank you. 
do I need a dress that lights it up? I'm not so sure. And that is the question uh, that's before us as a brand, as a company, and I think overall in the marketplace. Secondly, um, the, the second dilemma, I was on a plane from New York to LA the other week, and uh, in the center of Forbes magazine was this whole conversation about wearable technology, lots of pictures, and problem one, it's all ugly. And actually, Matthew did a great job of setting it up and talking about um, design, right? So what's happening? There's all this fantastic technology. We're not really sure what the purpose yet. And secondly, we're not really sure about design. So what I'd like to talk to you guys about today really is three things. Design to create emotional connection, focusing on the underserved consumer, and then third, targeting new categories within wearable tech that might be a little bit different than the current sectors today. So one of my favorite shows is Sex and the City, and I find this is a really amazing example of creating emotional connections, not with only with television, characters, people, but especially products. And when you think about it today, as most of the speakers already highlighted, the technology is already there. It's smaller, it's faster, it's more efficient. The foundation exists. So how do we now take a step back and say, how do we do this from a design-centric point of view? How do we put emotion back into the products that we develop? Because fundamentally, that's what everybody's looking for. They're looking for that, aha, I love it. Now, how does it work? Again, I use Sex and City as a reference point here. This is a video, I apologize, it's not very clear, but there's a scene where Carrie and Samantha are walking down the street in the front, in front of a window, and they see her in all the blondes. And the only thing she says is, hello, lover. And that is the emotional connection that I'm talking about creating with your product. How do we instantaneously, without knowing what it does, or how it functions, but by just looking at it, create that emotional connection. And of course, emotional connection is more than just look. It's, it's, for me, it's a whole sensory experience. How does it feel? How does it sound? How does it look when you put it out of the box? That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that emotional connection. I love a quote from a book called Predictable Magic. It's not how you feel about the design or the experience, but it's about how it makes you feel about yourself. And honestly, that's why I laugh. I mean, I wore all black today, because it actually makes me feel skinny. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about here. Um, so where do we look for inspiration? When we talk about creating emotional connections, um, we at Stelly find that fashion is a really fantastic place for us to turn to, to think about design. We think about what, what have they done well. They look at material. They look at fit. They look at finish. They look at colors. They look at trends in the marketplace, and they put it all together uh, to come up with an amazing fit. And then they have lines of products, right, that seamlessly integrate into your lifestyle. Whether that's sportswear, couture wear, dinner wear, there's, a, there's an appropriate collection for every part of everyone's life. And so that's what we at Stelly have turned, for, to, turned to for inspiration for our products when we think about design and starting that from a design perspective and then engineering our products. Um, so now we've talked about creating an emotional connection. Well, who do we create that emotional connection for? And we truly feel that the female consumer is completely underserved by this space in the marketplace. We already know she's past $20 trillion global consumer spend. She controls over 90% of the decision making in the marketplace, so she contributes to it if she doesn't control it. She already outspends men in consumer electronics by $14 billion, yet there's still no products that are designed specifically with her in mind. And last but not least, she's already adapting to technology at a much faster rate than her VR counterpart. And the way women look at technology is it's a bit different than men. Um, we look at simplicity, we look at seamless integration into our life, um, and we look at it more as, a, as a lifestyle product versus a gadget. So what's happening, is, and this is a quote from Boston Consulting Group just recently published, is fundamentally women's issues and needs are completely misunderstood in the marketplace. And this is a great example of what happens when someone gives me a, a manual I have to read for 10 or 15 minutes to figure out how to use a product. So what is it, what is it, what, what's the difference for women? So it's about simplicity, the seamless use of technology, and how that technology fits into your lifestyle. 
And I love this graphic. It's, I think it's, it's pretty simple, but it does say, you know, it used to be about how, how you could put a stereo system together, right? It was sort of your, your proven to manhood and how long it took you and how long the manual was. Well, with Design Out products, they're completely different. It's a one-touch pair and you're ready to play your music. It, it seamlessly integrates into your home decor and really highlights an accessory and a fashion item versus this whole big, huge setup of products and, and technologies that you have. And the nice part is, though, when you think about designing products for women and marketing to women, it's less about the female end of it, but it's more about the criteria list. And women tend to have a much longer criteria list that they go through when they're choosing products than men do. And the nice part is, most of the time, by the time you cross off all the things that women want in their products, you've achieved to actually um, do the same for men. So, and probably identify the needs that they didn't even have before. So there's lots of discussion of all various sectors and wearable tech and where is it going to go, what is it going to look like, and what is it going to do. And we truly feel that audio is, is a huge sector that's, that's currently being overlooked. And that's where Stanley really is, is playing today. And how do we really marry what we talked about fashion as inspiration, designing with a female consumer in mind, and really creating this new sector in the audio and wearable tech space. Uh, we've talked a lot about the evolution of wearable audio. It's not new, it's not a new discussion. You know, it started with, with the, the uh, boom box, and th thanks to Sony, we transitioned to the Walkman and the CD player. And now, you know, iPod and iPhones have truly made it possible for us to wear our technology and, and use it for our everyday life. So this is really the next iteration in, this, in that product life cycle. And, and music, we've talked a lot about music and, the last discussion was a little difficult to follow as, as, as a follow-up speaker, but uh, the latest research basically highlights that we listen to music now four hours a day. So whether that's in our car, in our home, on a speaker, headphones, it's a huge part of our life. Music is emotion and clearly contributes to a huge part of what we do in fashion, right? It drives fashion and um, fashion drives music. I use this example of why we started Stella. My husband and I got married, and he wanted to bring his fantastic speakers along with him. And they were great speakers, but they looked horrible in our home. And so we started this whole conversation around divorce <laughs> and whether we were going to get divorced if we brought our speakers along and what we could do differently to really highlight form meets function and function meets form. And our first product was really our first forte into fashion audio. But that's really, it came out of use, right? We talked about purpose. What's the purpose of all this technology? What are we doing with it? Really, the, the topic of today, convergence of wearable technology and fashion audio, we were the first to partner with a fashion designer, and we were the first to walk down the runway with our audio clutch. You can see Hillary Rada there walking down the runway uh, fashion, um, at the fashion show. Rebecca Minkoff really partnered with us. And when I say partner, she just didn't license her name and let us run with the products. We sat hand in hand in collaboration with her to design the audio clutch, um, what it looked like, what colors she chose, what materials she chose, and then we put the technology inside to make it all work. And you see the various uh, collaborations and things that we did with that product. And we truly feel that this is the space, fashion audio, um, and wearable technology, and it's coming together now through music. So I'd like to leave you with this quote for this evening um, to really think about what do we do with this clever technology and what do we really need it for? And how do we think about it differently from a design perspective? How do we think about it from a consumer perspective? Who, who are we focusing on? What does she need? And how is she going to use those products? And then I'd like to give you a little teaser. We have amazing products coming out in the fall. So definitely look at StellaAudio.com for the latest news and the uh, product releases that we're going to have uh, launching in September. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the awesome night tonight. Alright, so, how do I even start this introduction? Tonight we have a legend in the house. The gentleman I'm about to introduce to you has helped change hip hop history forever. In an industry that's mostly short lived, his group, Naughty by Nature, has proven time and time again that staying true to your brand is always a recipe for success. 
Vincent Vinrock Brown is a hip hop mogul and a community activist from East Orange, New Jersey, where he continues to speak out against drug and gang violence. Vin organizes and participates in a multitude of forums, rallies, and conferences to help spread positive messages to the youth. So, I present to you hip hop legend Vin Rock. Thank you. Thank you guys for staying. By no means do I have an extravagant presentation. Uh, I was invited by Mike to come and speak and just share my experience uh, with wearable tech. And to be honest, it's a very analog relationship. Our first experience with wearable tech was the teacher. You know, our first symbol was OPP. Uh, Tommy Boy Records, and when the record blew up, we made these t-shirts, so everyone wanted these tees, man, everyone, and I was like, you know what, that, that works, they wanted the tee, probably more than they wanted the music, so we started to evolve different product, uh, we eventually opened a store, and that's what, you know, definitely brought the crowd to the table, and I was like, you know what, that technology works in merchandising. So then we got into the age of the internet. And I remember opening my store at 106 uh, Halsey Street, downtown Long, New Jersey. And I knew nothing about computers, you know. We, I was college bound, but music took us. And, you know, we were like 20 years old all over the world. But I opened my store, and I remember this first computer set up. Cost me about 30 grand, my accountant at the time. It's like, Vin, just get this computer system. I didn't know anything about it. But I did realize that the internet, you know, and World Wide Web, that, that just correlated with me because I understood, like, from our cassettes, it was all snail mail. You had to put your merchandise in the cassette, people had to rip it out and send it to you, you send it back. But I knew that the internet would definitely help you harness your audience and, and, you know, you're able to use that data to further engage your fans. After that, you know, you got into Napster and, and the, the, the mobile space. I started using the Palm Pilot and, and Windows Mobile. Eventually, I got into uh, Android, and I realized, wow, the smartphone definitely is a direct connection with the fans, you know? And we became, we came off of the uh, major record labels, and we became independent. So I knew tech, you know, wearable tech in, in, in the form of uh, just merchandising alone and, and the evolution of the smartphone definitely cut out the middleman, and that, that's what it was about for me. So after that, we, we, we started reaching out. I reached out to people at Google. That's my friend, Gwen Shen. You know, we worked with them at Google Play. I evolved into the Google uh, Android TV platform, Google TV platform. And it was the power of our brand that, you know, enabled me to meet different people and, and get developers to work with us for basically free because of the brand. So again, it helped us empower. I saw the future of smart TVs and if you're able to have like a, a, an app you're able to get paid subscribers. I'm like, hey, I could be HBO, I could be, you know, Comcast. It's about digital subscribers, direct the fan base. And then eventually we came across Monster Products. I have a friend who works for Monster. And, uh, you know, this, this wearable technology. Actually, I, I got to give it up to Dr. Dre and uh, uh, Jimmy Iovine over there at Beats. People have been waiting for this detox album forever. They've given them everything but. They've given them speakers, they've given them headphones, you're, you're in cars, you're in the house, they've even flipped the company for a billion dollars, and the fans still don't have detox. <laughs> so I think that, that's great, even a uh, music streaming service. So I understand the power of that. And now for us, with our analog wearables and the new digital tech wearables, it creates that lifestyle brand, that emotional connection that few other uh, speakers spoke about. And to me, that's what it's about, being a legendary brand, a legendary uh, group. It's all about that direct and, and engaging.
engagement with your fans. So once they have that emotional connection, they'll never let you go. They'll never let you go. It works for women, works for the watches, and then that's our girl, Queen Latifah. So, you know, when we had her as our spokesperson, she was the first one to put us out there and, and, and co-sign our wearables. So, in the future, we're going to keep expanding, and I love all of the different technologies, uh, companies who are out here incorporating so much more technology and, you know, more analog wearables. So, that convergence will be great. We'll even get into edibles. <laughs> Animals. We'll get into that. I, I love the power of branding and a lot of these companies out here. I mean, right now the major labels have a lot of the new artists on 360 deals. So if you're trying to launch products, it is a good idea to go to these majors. They have a gamut of every genre of music. You can partner up with, you know, different artists. If, if your product makes sense, it makes it easier now. So once again, I want to thank you guys for having me. Thanks for staying and listening. And any uh, football fans, get ready for the Giants this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.